Today we actually have a multi-person uh, PowerPoint. Uh, I'll start out, uh, Dave Adams with DEC, uh, Ed McGowan will join us, and Denise Appleby, and hopefully Paul Reggae uh, with on-the-ground uh, examples of projects that have occurred. Uh, and I was hoping as well that Ethan Angel from New York uh, Department of Ag and Markets would join us uh, in person here at, at uh, 6.5 Broadway. but. Um, Either he's being held hostage at our security desk, or uh, he hasn't quite made it here yet. So while I do have a number of technical slides uh, pertaining to regulation, background information from a federal and state perspective for developing and implementing a biocontrol, um, I will go through them fairly quickly and make them available to anyone who wants them as a resource, as a reference resource. So while there is a lot of text on some of these slides, it's basically uh, because it's for reference for future use. So biological control, of course, is the use of natural organisms to control weeds, insects, or pathogen pests. And classical biological control is uh, the act of going to the native range for either the, or the plant or invertebrate, uh, the target organism, identifying the natural enemies, testing extensively, for host specificity uh, and other complications, then rearing the complex of uh, specific natural enemies uh, for future release in the new environment. And I stress that complex of host uh, specific natural enemies because a lot of times it's the ideal biocontrol program is more than one organism. And of course, this is most successfully implemented when the natural enemies for your biocontrol agents are not present in the environment you're releasing them in. Just a quick graphic to show uh, typically with plants, uh, your populations go up and down a bit. As your biocontrol agents are first released, you get a, a pretty quick uh, growth curve where they uh, maximize their populations. And then they also uh, fluctuate up and down um, as a reflection of the weed densities uh, and population fluctuations that naturally occur. And they're off by a little bit usually because they react to uh, the weed population. But in time, your overall weed density drops below what your acceptable damage threshold is oftentimes, but you tend not to actually um, get rid of completely your target weed or invertebrate species. Advantages, of course, are host specificity, uh, limited side effects usually, um, Long term, a reduced cost, although initially there is a very high cost to the research and testing. And long term management. Uh, oftentimes, our uh, time and uh, manpower intensive on the ground management, including mowing, burning, herbicide use, flooding, uh, it's very expensive, if you, especially when adding in the manpower hours required to undertake such work. And biocontrol also complements the New York State priority to promote a toxic-free future by reducing the use of toxic chemicals and investigating green technology. I do want to uh, caution folks, though, that classical biological control is just one uh, form of uh, control that is being utilized uh, targeting pest organisms and plants these days. And I certainly can't speak to all these various uh, types of control that are used under both biological and chemical. Uh, I just wanted to show this graphic to indicate that uh, the area of uh, industry has become quite complex with classical, uh, inundative, uh, augmentative biological control as well as chemical control, synthetic, microbial uh, produced phytotoxin, et cetera. A recent paper published in 2010 in biological control uh, stated that of the 70 cases reviewed for biological control, 21 of the cases were focused on agricultural targets and 49 on natural environment targets. So this sort of shows you while agricultural and natural resources both use biocontrol, um, there is uh, about twice as many uh, biological control projects currently being implemented for natural resource reasons. Uh, looking at the numbers uh, and percentages within those numbers, 
that are either complete, partial, or in progress still, you note that a considerable number of the projects are still in progress. They've not met their official objectives. Uh, and just another graphic, uh, sometimes biocontrol is not as effective as originally intended or thought that it would be, or the effect uh, has a bit more of a lag time than originally anticipated for a number of different ecological reasons. And I'm not going to go through this one in detail either, but it uh, just indicates that there's a number of different issues that can impact um, the overall efficacy of your program or the overall timeline of achieving your great goal. So, and looking at some of the uh, work out there for biocontrol, in addition to the existing legal and regulatory arena, there's also an industry code of conduct that is out there for the use of biological control and implementation of biological control at an international level. And its uh, objectives are to facilitate safe import, export, and release of exotic biocontrol agents and to give uh, guidance at both the national and international level for both releasers, uh, regulators, and uh, producers of biological control. The elements of that code of conduct are uh, focused on the authorities uh, for import, uh, importers, exporters, uh, and responsibilities after import and export. And, and again, there's lots of details um, in that document, but I just want to make folks aware that it does exist. It's out there. Closer to home, New Jersey has a biological control of plant pests uh, building in which they raise numerous biological control agents for distribution in the Northeast. Uh, this is a shot of the building itself and their brochure, which is uh, produced and run by the New Jersey Department of Agriculture. And four of the projects are the Hemlock, Lily, Delgid, Mile a Minute, Purple, Loose Stripe, and the Mexican Bean Beetle. So back to the federal level, uh, USDA APHIS Plant Protection and Quarantine uh, oversees the biological control uh, program. And their goal is to safeguard American agriculture production in natural areas from significant economic loss, negative impacts caused by insects, non-insect arthropods, nematodes, weeds, diseases of regulatory significance by supporting, developing, and implementing biological control technology. They do have a significant amount of information on their website regarding programs they are currently un undertaking and research they are working on for future projects. Within the USDA APHIS, uh, there's what's called a TAG group, a technical advisory group, to facilitate biological control of weeds. So it's focused on weeds in North America. Um, and basically, they review test plant lists and petitions by organizations or individuals for first-time field release of biological control agents. They suggest test plants, identify conflicts of interest, and assess risk prior to any permits being issued by USDA. The membership of that TAG group is extensive on the federal agency uh, side of things, uh, NBCI, Ag Research Services, uh, on and on, Forest Service, Natural Resource Conservation Service, Bureau of Land Management, basically all the federal agencies. But they also have the ability to bring on three to four additional expertise members for any one project uh, based on the need. So what is the TAG process? Well, there's the petitioner who wants to release the organism. Um, and then there's the organization um, review process within TAG. Uh, and as I indicated earlier, their basic job is to review the petition look at the biology, the test data, rec make recommendations for additional to be done, review those, and make a recommendation after uh, going back and forth amongst themselves uh, to USDA on whether or not a permit should be issued uh, for that organism. And let's see, this is, uh, well, this is the part that I was hoping uh, New York State Ag and markets might be able to pipe in on, but uh, basically PPQ 526 um, 
here is part of the process uh, that uh, the states are also brought in um, to this whole process through the state uh, ag agencies usually. But I'm not going to go through all the details here on their um, their guidelines, but there is a, about a 55-page document that the TAG team utilizes uh, to guide their decision-making processes so that everyone has the same um, process concepts in mind and the same rules regarding uh, decision-making. So to take that one step further, um, the Environmental Policy Act and Endangered Species Act come into play. Um, in deciding whether or not a EA or EIS need to be developed for the release of the biological control agents. Um, and this slide here, you can, again, read in further detail uh, the details under either a biological assessment or an EIS. Uh, but for the most part, most of the projects that we are implementing here at the state level went through this uh, environmental assessment process and ended up having a finding of no significant impact. So for most of these projects you hear about in, uh, in more detail at the end, there are EAs and FONSIs out there uh, by the federal agencies for those projects. Uh, some of the information from the TAG team uh, is a little dated, but here you see uh, in 2006, uh, a list of projects were put together that they were currently working on and hope to work on for future release in both the eastern region of North America and western region. Uh, and as you look through this list, you'll see that we're at the phase where a number of these are now implementable biological control projects. So while not all of them come to fruition, a number of the projects they have been working on have made significant progress and are now being implemented on the ground. Uh, here are the weed lists, uh, eastern and western. And their 2009 report is available online, which talks in more detail about additional projects uh, that they've conducted within the last year and a half. Uh, and it's quite detailed. So it's worth downloading if you're uh, truly interested in, in the biological control biology behind a number of the projects that USDA PBQ is working on. One of the uh, agreements they have for international testing is with a European organization in Switzerland, uh, BABI, and uh, you know, part of those federal funds help support uh, CABI and, and further that research uh, because, as many of you know, a lot of those insects that are imported are European of, of origin, and it's a lot easier to have the, the work coordinated from a European body. There's also work being done elsewhere in the world. Uh, South America has a similar report out with partnerships with the USDA uh, in 2009 for their biological collection. A number of the species on their list are of interest to us. So getting a little closer to home and what impacts us when we think about implementing a, a control program here in New York. Uh, federal form PPQ 526 is required for uh, the movement of plant pass biological control agents um, between states. And document uh, here's the old paper form, uh, now a fillable online document, uh, which you can complete and you will receive an electronic version of the permit uh, back. And here's an example of a uh, permit received for an organism, a biological control organism. So this is required first before you apply for your state permits. Um, for the most part, you know, once an organism is released in the United States, um, there's pretty quick turnaround on the uh, PPQ 526 forms. But just keep in mind, you do have that federal uh, permit that needs to be in place if you're moving organisms across state lines. Within 
In New York, we have both ag and markets law and DEC law that are applicable to biological control. Uh, I'm not going to go in a lot of detail here. If uh, ag and markets do show up, they can go into a little more detail, but their section 164A is focused on the shipment of live pests. And within DEC, we have uh, two sections, uh, 11.05.07 and the definitions, 11.01.03, which apply uh, to the release of non-native uh, organisms uh, or the release of wildlife within the state. Some of the language is a little bit unique here within the New York State law. Uh, the release of invertebrates um, is covered under uh, the definition of wildlife, uh, in that wildlife means wild game and all other animal life existing in a wild state, except fish, shellfish, and crustacea. So within New York State, the Purple Blue Stripe Bowel Control Program put together a permit application process so about 12 years ago. Uh, we modeled it after the grass carp uh, program. And uh, some of you may have used this uh, process in the past, but these applications actually are processed at the regional level at our nine different offices around the state, which is a little bit different than the generic uh, application uh, to liberate wildlife, which goes through central office. This application for purple loose stripe bowel control does have uh, standard language um, to help anyone filling out the form and it also has standard conditions. Uh, one of the conditions is monitoring. There is a suggested monitoring protocol that is available from Cornell University, but it's not mandatory. But uh, I just point that out because monitoring well, is important. Dawn and Nick Tender, and it turns out to be incredibly sympathetic because these haunting stories of Dawn and Nick Tender have been shared by Dr. Ryan Hamilton. I'm just going to back up for one second here and go back to uh, Ag and Markets um, and let uh, let Ethan talk a little bit about uh, Section 164A for a moment. I apologize. Uh, I thought we were going to start at 11.30. Obviously, we got to start a little bit earlier than I expected. But um, uh, with respect to Article 14 of the New York State Agriculture Markets Law, um, Section 164 uh, dictates that uh, any person that is going to offer for sale or move uh, live plant pests uh, has to uh, apply for a permit through the department. And uh, the way that we issue those permits is generally uh, through uh, the APHIS permitting process. I don't know if Dave has touched on that at all, but that's we're a signatory to that federal process. And that, um, if you're moving into the state of New York, uh, you need that permit anyhow, so uh, we only make you apply for the federal permit. And because we're a signatory on it, uh, that satisfies the requirements in Article 14. So while the federal form uh, is typically thought of as a APHIS PPQ process, uh, the State Ag and Markets Department is involved in the approval process with uh, 526. So going on to, uh, again, New York State uh, DEC uh, regulations and, and forums. Uh, the generic form to liberate fish or wildlife is a form that's often necessary uh, because we don't have project-specific applications except for purple blue stripe. So the generic uh, application um, has some general uh, requirements, but unfortunately it's it's not nearly the ideal application for a biological <coughs> control um, release. So we do have some advice to applicants that's been developed relatively recently, um, and that is to complete a separate application for each biocontrol species. So don't list multiple species on a single application because you're never going to be able to fit all the available, in the available space, the necessary information for each of those species. Ensure that each application contains a hard copy of the supporting documentation that you're sending in. Um, include study design with the application, especially for initial releases in the state. Describing your location, proposed release, uh, number of organisms to be released, uh, when during the field, <laughs> take those releases, 
and provide copies of your federal permit with this package. If you know where you're going to obtain your Bio Patrol agents, including that information is also uh, useful. So hopefully some of this guidance will help eliminate back and forth communications that over the last couple of years uh, folks have had to have from a regulatory perspective to uh, obtain a what's considered a complete application. There is a section of the regulations um, that outline um, how special licenses and permits uh, operate. And uh, those definitions in Uniform Procedures Acts do define uh, some department actions that are required uh, for applications. Uh, a timeline for determining if an application is complete. Another timeline uh, that if an applicant does not hear from the department, the applicant does have the opportunity to uh, communicate with the department uh, via certified mail regarding that initial application. And the department has 15 working days to respond to that second communication. Uh, so those are part of the Uniform Procedures Acts that currently exist in our rules and regulations pertaining to generic liberation of fish and wildlife permit. <clears throat> we have met internally a couple times to try to figure out how to streamline our biocontrol permit process and the Office of Invasive Species Coordination recommended a few uh, concepts be considered, including uh, creating a new biocontrol uh, application instead of using the generic Fish and Wildlife Liberation uh, application, utilizing a multi-agency, multidisciplinary review process for initial releases of a biocontrol project. Base, mostly the secret documentation required on the existing federal EA or EISs uh, that are available. Uh, in other words, don't necessarily try to reinvent the wheel uh, as far as background documentation. And consider the national and regional status of releases to date uh, when making uh, the decision regarding uh, the application. Also, be aware of the entire suite of bio patrol agents needed to control your target uh, such that if there are concerns with any one of that suite of agents, that that's communicated with the applicant so there's an understanding, um, at least for the short term, of what the applicant may uh, expect as far as implementation of that ideal program. So while a number of folks that have worked on biocontrol uh, have realized some of the hurdles that exist from a regulatory perspective to biocontrol. We're not unique in this situation. And I put this slide in here just to demonstrate that uh, relatively recently, all of the European countries that have regulations pertaining to the biological control of organisms have tried to come together to streamline and harmonize their process. Um, so it's not just us states within the North America and the U.S. Uh, that have sometimes um, contradictory regulations. Uh, the European Un Union is also working to try to streamline their uh, initiatives. So hopefully over the next couple of years we'll all make progress in this area and uh, have uh, you know, a rigorous review process that is needed uh, when you're releasing non-native organisms, but also have a process um, that works a little more uh, fluidly for the applicant. Before we uh, jump over to our field applications, I just wanted to note that there are considerable amount of or body of literature out there on biocontrol. Uh, this is one example of a fairly comprehensive document that was put out uh, in the early 2000s on uh, biocontrol of invasive plants in eastern North America and the United States. Uh, there are additional species or program specific documents put out by the very same team, the Forest Health Technology Enterprise team, and the Purple Loose Stripe is one example of uh, a sub-document uh, of a focused nature. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our on-the-ground uh, folks who have some experience with both the regulatory 
and the ecology of implementing biocontrol. And let uh, Denise Daphne talk a little bit about purple loose strife, Ed McGowan, Mile a Minute, and Paul Reggae, uh, Leafy Spurred. So, is it possible to unmute all the lines and see if Paul was able to make it on? Dave, they should be unmuted, so if he's there, uh, just ask for him. The only call and user I, do, I um, muted so far was user 36. I'll unmute that person temporarily right now. Okay. Hello, Paul Reggae, are you out there by chance? I'm forced to read it while on vacation that I literally cried about it. Okay, I don't think Paul made it in. Um, Okay, sounds like we have it covered. Uh, Ethan can cover some of his uh, material. So first I'll turn it over to Denise uh, to talk about the Purple Loose Drive program a little bit. And uh, many of you probably received an email recently regarding the availability of biocontrol agents for Purple Loose Drive. And it's from her team out at the Tonawana Oak Orchard Wildlife Area. Okay, my name's Denise Appleby. I am a uh Fish and Wildlife Technician out here at the state sub-office at Iroquois National Wildlife Refuge. I've been working on the Purple Loosestrife uh, for about 11 years. And in the 90s, a, a loosestrife, well, Purple Loosestrife Beetle Nursery was established out here uh, and has resulted in a significant wild population of Gallaricella beetles. Once uh, the license has been approved by the real wildlife manager for the region of release, I take that information and I try to figure out how much, how many beetles are going to be needed for the amount of loose stripe that is in the area. And I go out into the field and I collect the beetles using an aspirator. They're collected one or two at a time off existing loose stripe plants and these beetles are counted as they're collected and to larger containers with vented lids and some blue strike for them to feed on while they're en route. And they're either shipped overnight, UPS, FedEx, or I arrange for the applicant to pick them up so that they get them pretty much overnight or within two days so that they have a better survival rate. Um, the really start collecting beetles out here in the early, probably the third week of May, and go right through mid-July. Um, obviously, earlier you get them, the better chance you're going to have of uh, regeneration on the already targeted plant that you want them on, and we generally can pull off three generations of purple loosestrife beetles out here during the, during the summer if, it's, if it stays warm enough and not too wet. Um, that's generally generally my position out here. Thanks, Denise. Um, just a few pointers for folks that might want to apply for uh, biocontrol agents or purple loose drive. Uh, basically, we're talking about the leaf-eating beetles of which there are two of them, um, you'll get a mix of the two because unless you look real carefully, you can't really tell the difference. Um, but perhaps can you give folks um, a few little pointers on uh, you know, when they should have the applications into you, uh, what they can expect for, for the most part uh, as far as uh, when most of the beetles are harvested and shipped out to folks? The best time to get your application in is as soon as possible because it does have to go that route of being approved by the regional manager in the area that it's going to get released in, which can take a little bit. So the sooner you get it in, the better. Um, once I get it, as soon as the loose drive beetles are available, <laughs> and uh, arrange the best time for both of us and we can get them right out there. I like to see the I like to see the applications approved and here by the beginning of May. Um, 
probably the largest amount of beetles are, are collected in the second week of June and then again in the second week of July. So there is some time. I realize that some of the loose strife hasn't really shown itself in more of the northern areas, so they're a little behind. So there's there's a month to five weeks playtime there, and uh, that should it should be able to uh, be acceptable for everybody to get their beetles, but as soon as possible to try to get those applications in and approved. Thanks. Hopefully that gives people uh, some of the logistical uh, dates to aim for. Uh, here on your screen you can see uh, the targeted application uh, of the Forest Health Technology Enterprise team's work to pull together the background biology, the monitoring protocols, and the ecology and documented success of a biocontrol program. the Purple Stripe Biocontrol Program, as well as a number of others here. I'll turn it over to Ed McGowan to talk about Mile a Minute. Okay, um, I, I see we're kind of running late in the uh, call here, so I'm going to try to blast through a bunch of slides. Uh, everybody hearing that disturbance? Dave, are you hearing that? Can people hear me? Yeah. Yep, Ed, I can hear you. I think that there are some people that um, I keep seeing Rock's name popping up. Might be if he can mute himself, that would be helpful. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm down in the lower Hudson Valley. I'm the science director at the Palisades Inter Park, Interstate Park Commission. I've been working on mile a minute for about six years and biocontrol the last three years. Um, Dave, can I have the next slide? For those of you that uh, aren't familiar with the plant, it's a aggressive annual vine that's a native of East Asia, and it made it into the east coast of the U.S. about 1930, and it's been spreading rapidly. I think it's spread about 400 miles since its original introduction in Virginia and Maryland. Uh, it's a problem because it's a really prolific seed producer, and it's, it's one of those invasive plants that can smother other plants in its path. And it, it really likes forest openings, uh, open wetlands, but we found that it has a pretty high tolerance for partial shade and even drier sites, so it's not as prolific in its seed production in those situations. It is kind of a fragile plant. It'll, a frost will take it out, but it's usually done its business by then, and it's, it's gone to seed well before that. Uh, next slide. So quickly, just to identify it, it has these distinctive features. Um, it's got triangular shaped leaves, these recurved barbs, and then what are called ocrea, which are these circular leafy structures. And that's next. That's really what sets it apart from our native look-alike species. There's, there's two polygonum uh, tear thumbs that are often found with mile a minute. And while they have the prickles and somewhat similar leaves, they don't have the ocrea. And it's amazing how people, even with these characteristics in hand, will misidentify it. So it always pays to to ground truth and actually get out to a site and see if people are reporting the right plant. Next. In New York, it's mostly restricted to southeastern part of the state, though we did have a verified um, sighting up in Ithaca last summer. It should be on this map. And I, I suspect it's underreported across the southern tier because it is in northern Pennsylvania. Next. Dave, next. Hey, Dave. Oh, thanks. Um, so you can see, if you can make out this map, it's kind of clustered um, in, the, in southeastern New York down here in the New Jersey border and west of the Hudson. And I think some of that's a reporting artifact. Uh, those are largely public lands where we have access. Um, they also have some more open habitat. I think it's, it's underreported in southeastern New York. Um, but it's not spreading as rapidly as, as things like plants like stiltgrass. So there is some some hope, and we're, we're trying to still consider it a early detection species, though that's probably a little too optimistic. Next. Uh, so back in 2005, Emily Hauser, DEC, and I were speaking about potential uh, invasive projects for early detection species, and we settled on mile a minute and hosted a meeting 
an informational meeting and had a really good turnout for it. And out of that meeting came the Mile a Minute Project of the Hudson Valley. And its, its mission over time has been to try to – really, originally we wanted to be able to eradicate the plant, but that's not realistic. Uh, we just like to contain it and, uh, and try to manage its spread. Next. We've been very fortunate over the years to have uh, a succession of very competent SCA interns, including Meredith Taylor, who's monitoring this or moderating this call, um, and that was that was uh, done through cooperative program with DEC and uh, an SCA that was lost to budget cuts. And now the last last year and hopefully this year we'll be able to still have that position um, through a program with USDA APHIS, uh, where they help fund part of it and SEA covers the other part. And that's really critical to a project like this because there's just too much to do in terms of follow-up and monitoring for someone to fit it into their regular activities. Um, we've tried a bunch of different things. This is just a shot of an experiment that we did, kind of a little side study uh, with the Glenwood Center. They got a grant to look at goat uh, management of invasives. And Goats do eat mile a minute, but it's one of the last things they eat. So um, we think there's pretty limited application in natural environments for using goats. Perhaps on ag lands, they would be useful. Uh, there was also work done by Gary Coppell's lab up in University of Albany on sheep and uh, controlling mile a minute. And that was done at Ward Pound Ridge. And he had more success with sheep than we did with goats. Um, I'm really going to have to <laughs> cover things very briefly. But this is the biocontrol agent uh, in the top center of the photo here. That's, that's a weevil. Uh, it's from China, and it was identified through a cooperative venture between the University of Delaware and Chinese scientists. And they screened a large number of uh, pests and pathogens a mile a minute in its native range. And they settled on this organism because it's highly host-specific. Apparently, it only eats okay. mile a minute. And as part of the quarantine and testing process, they established that in no-choice experiments where they put the weevils in a cage with one of our closely, most closely related native species, such as the tear thumbs, it fed just a little bit and it couldn't reproduce. So the belief is that it's a fairly safe, and I say that with some you know, parentheses, um, biocontrol agent because it's so host-specific and that it's unlikely to eliminate mile a minute, so it should have plants um, available to it, so the likelihood for it to switch or to have selective pressure at least to switch to other host plants um, should be fairly low. But you never know what nature is going to do. Uh, next slide. So here's another shot just to give you a sense of how tiny they are. These are adults. Um, they have a very quick generation time. You can get three or four generations in a summer. Next slide. And this is what they look like. Uh, they come in batches of about 500, and it's a highly technical release technique. Can you uh, give me the next slide? You tip the little container, and out they come. So it's very simple to do. The real work is in the monitoring that follows. Next. And, and these weevils are from that Trenton, New Jersey facility. And, and to date, they've been free, which is really been great because it's allowed us to move forward without a lot of funding for this project. So once the weevils are released, um, they feed on the leaves, and this is the kind of shotgun patterning that's typical. There are some other species out there that also feed on mile a minute. Mile a minute. Um, Japanese beetles are pretty aggressive with mile a minute, and you know they evolved in the same part of the world, um, but they're more generalist, and they don't really limit mile a minute the way the weevil does. Uh, this is what it looks like with light feeding. Next slide. Heavy feeding, this is what you want. You want defoliation. And really what you're after is for the plants to be stressed to the point where their fecundity is lowered. They're putting out fewer seeds annually. And over time, that'll, that will amount to a, a reduction in the patch density for the plant. And hopefully the weevils will then be <coughs> numerous enough to kind of limit the amount of mile a minute within a given area and allow other vegetation to uh, come in. Uh, next slide. 
And I forgot to mention, they, they do also lay their eggs on the plant, and when the eggs hatch, they burrow into the plant and develop in, in the stem of the plant near the leaf nodes, and that further stresses the plant. Um, these maps show where we've released vinyl minute weevils to date. Uh, it's really the map on the left. You can see the red dots. Um, the one on the right is a reference map that corresponds with the one on the left. So we've, we've released uh, mostly on uh, state lands uh, and one, one nature preserve. Um, the weevils are very good dispersers. They can fly long distances, uh, but to really get control within a reasonable time period, you want to release a thousand or more in an individual location. Um, but studies down south where they've been released previously have found that they've moved you know, several miles, in some cases within a year or two, from the nearest known release site. So that's a real positive. Um, we're hoping that <coughs> by spreading out our releases like we have, that, that we'll get some infilling and weevils will find other occurrences in other areas. Next slide. Uh, the real labor-intensive part of this project is the monitoring, and there are two approaches. One is a quick monitoring approach, and this was developed by University of Delaware, and that's just basically qualitative assessment of presence, absence of weevils several times a year within the release site. You don't gain a lot of information from that, but at least you can track whether your release was successful. And to date, most releases have resulted in a establishment of a population. There have been very few that have failed. Um, you rarely get dramatic immediate results, but at least the animals overwinter successfully after a release in most cases. And, and uh, you know, in places where they've been released many years ago, there's, there's some noticeable um, improvement in the sites. Uh, the other monitoring approach is more labor intensive, and that involves uh, transects with actual counts, and you can imagine you're trying to count these very tiny, almost microscopic organisms, and they're a little shy and they'll drop off the leaves if you spook them, so um, that, can be, that can be difficult, and that's another reason why having a dedicated staff member or project coordinator is so important, so that that work gets done and there's some continuity to it as well. So this is my last slide um, on the mile a minute project of the Hudson Valley website, which you can Google, and it's, it's um, posted on the Herner website through DEC. Uh, we've tried to streamline this process for other people that would like to uh, do biocontrol a mile a minute, and the instructions and the various permits are posted here, and that was something we did last year with Stephanie Mogul, our project coordinator, and we managed to recruit a number of other participants, West Point Military Reservation, I believe Ward Pound Ridge Reservation, um, Ariana Newell with Parks down on Long Island. So there, there are a number of other sites that are applying and hoping to uh, release weevils this year. Um, we found that Trenton, who's the source for the weevils, will only allot a certain number, about up to about 6,000 weevils per applicant. And when we started, everything was under my name, so we were limited to 6,000 weevils. So if we get more applicants, uh, we're more likely to get <coughs> more sites online and, and more weevils um, coming to New York. So that's as quick as I can speak, and uh, if anybody has any questions, um, let me know.